most of you probably are aware of the fact uh, that we have a school here at Calvary Chapel. It's called Calvary Chapel Academy. It started last year. This is its second year. And um, what you may not know is that they begin their days each morning with a devotional. And um, a few months ago, I guess, at this point, an email was going around inviting some of the staff here at the church to come and lead the students in uh, a devotional. And, I, and we were given a list of psalms to choose from. They're going straight through the book of Psalms. And um, there, there was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 psalms on there. And one of the psalms that jumped out at me just from looking at that list was Psalm 27. I remembered that there was something extra good in Psalm 27. I don't know exactly what it was. Um, but I, I knew that there was a verse or a few verses in there that I really liked. So I opened it up. And uh, there it was, verses 4 that I share with you tonight. One thing I've desired of the Lord. And um, anything that has to do with um, the presence of God or being close to God, I just I attach myself to those verses. Um, I just love them because um, sometimes when I myself find myself uh, feeling um, like I'm losing my passion or I'm in a rut, I go back to those verses to kind of stir me up. So I, uh, I chose that, that psalm for that reason because it had that verse. And I was like, oh, I could preach that all day long, the presence of God and drawing near to God. That's my favorite thing. And the more and more I began to study it, um, the Lord just kind of opened my eyes to this, the whole psalm in just uh, in a way that I didn't expect. And uh, so I'm excited to, um, to go through Psalm 27 with you guys. You guys there? Ready to go? All right, so it's a psalm of David. And uh, again, this, I think this is fitting because we just finished studying the life of David. He's going to come back around in First Chronicles um, but we love David. If, if, if someone were to ask you, who, who are your favorite Bible characters besides Jesus? Give me your top three. Most people that I've talked to, at least, will put David's on their list. We love David because he's um, devoted to God. He's got this heart for God. He's passionate. Um, but one reason we love David is because he, he's flawed. He's just like us. He's really relatable. He's got this heart for God, but every once in a while, he just it doesn't quite get there, and he messes up, and we mess up. So I think we relate to him really well. And what we have here in the Psalms is extremely valuable. We have, uh, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. Um, we have his, like, his journal, his diary, his songbook available to us. How many other uh, people's diaries do you have just sitting on your desk at home that you can open up and read and learn from? Probably not many. So here we have something super, super valuable in the book of Psalms, and uh, if you've read any Psalms, you've already noticed that David is an extremely emotional guy. Uh, he, he experiences really high highs, but he also has really low lows. And sometimes it's in the same breath. Usually it's in the same Psalm as we're going see to tonight, see tonight. Sometimes he's really encouraged. And other times it seems like he's just uh, in great despair. He's an extremely emotional guy. And emotions are an interesting thing. We know that, that emotions are good. They're a gift from God. God himself experiences emotion. God knows happiness and joy and love. But he also experiences negative emotions. God knows sadness and sorrow and loss and, and disappointment. He knows those emotions very well. Um, so we know that emotions are a good thing. They, they bring color to life, color to our lives and, and um, of vibrancy. And even the, ne the negative emotions are good. Sadness is good. Loss and grief is good. Imagine losing someone you love and showing up to their memorial service and not feeling anything. That would be awful. There's something therapeutic and healing and meaningful about sadness and loss and grief. Emotions are a good thing. But I want to throw this caveat on there. They're a good thing when we learn to have a proper relationship with them. Because if we don't, emotions can also be extremely destructive. You know, it's one thing to experience fear, and it's another thing to live in fear. It's one thing to experience sadness. It's another thing to live in sadness, to experience sorrow, to live in sorrow, to be taken captive by these emotions. Um, Emotions can be a good thing, but they can also be really destructive. 
And so when I was teaching the students on that day, what I wanted to get across to them is uh, studying in school, book smarts is a good thing. You know, they, they should continue um, studying the math and the history and, and all that. It's great. But what they don't teach in school, and maybe they should, um, you know, they teach you how to solve math problems and logic problems, but they don't teach you how to solve the problems in your own heart. You know, what good is it if you have, uh, if you are extremely intelligent, if you don't know how to address the feelings you're feeling and to process them, then does it really matter? Um, there, there's IQ, your intelligence quotient, but there's this thing called EQ. Have you heard of this? Your emotional quotient. Um, and some people... Uh, develop when, when, when everything is going right. Most people develop emotionally uh, in a healthy way, but a lot of people don't. So there, there are times where you meet adults, and, um, and it, it's sad when you interact with them. You see how they process their feelings and their thoughts, and you can just tell something went wrong because they're responding in an emotional way as if they were still a child or, or, or a young teenager, and it just doesn't make sense. Um, so it's important that we learn to have a healthy relationship with our emotions um, because uh, a lot of times, again, we meet people and we ourselves can get stuck and trapped by the things that we feel and experience. It's a big problem. And the thing is we can't just turn off. We can't just turn off negative emotions. You can't just turn off sadness and say, I'm not going to be sad anymore. I'm not going to feel hopeless anymore. I'm not going to feel lonely anymore. You can't just turn off emotions. I think that's, I think that's part of, um, if you can do that, I think that's part of being a psychopath, actually. I think they just turn things off. So if you can do that, let's talk later. <laughs> you can't just turn it off. Um, so what do we do with it? We've got young people dealing with things inside in their hearts and minds. They don't know what to do with it. Most people learn to live with and cope with and distract these um, these things that they experience. And uh, I want to I suggest that there's a better way tonight. I want to look at, at David, a man of uh, many emotions, as we discussed, high highs, low lows, and a man who also had more reason to fear and worry and be discouraged than, than any of us probably ever will in our lives. How did, how did he function? Well, in Psalm 27... We're not told the direct context. Sometimes it tells you exactly when it happened. We don't know exactly when this took place in his life. But here's the context from what we're going to read in the psalm. Verse 11 tells us, David says, My enemies are waiting for me. And in verse 13, we are told that he is being threatened with violence. So I think we can safely say and conclude that when David wrote Psalm 27, he was tempted to be overtaken with fear. He was tempted to be overtaken by fear. Now, it's, it's hard to, um, to boil it down to that. Um, you, when, when someone's out to get you, like, like these, his enemies were, it's hard to say that David was fighting just against fear, because I'm sure it's a mix of things. It's fear, it's anxiety, it's discouragement, it's probably a bunch of things rolled into one. But, but I've chosen to, um, to go with fear tonight and just kind of use that as a catch-all, um, because David mentions three times in the psalm, he brings up himself uh, that he's dealing with fear. So it's hard to boil it down directly. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that as we go through this tonight, this isn't, the, the purpose of us looking at the psalm isn't so you can fight your battle against fear. It may be fear for you, um, but it, it may be something else. You know, I don't know where, where it is that you go when you're in a, in a bad headspace or you're experiencing negative emotion. It could be fear, it could be anxiety, it could be worry, it could be hopelessness, it could be despair, it could be a mix of all of the above. Um, so you know what it is for you. Um, for me, I'll just go ahead and, and throw it out there. Um, my battle a lot of times is with disappointment. I, I sometimes find myself easily disappointed with myself easily disappointed with other people, easily disappointed with God and where I'm at in life and where I'm going. And disappointment can lead to um, a lack of hope. 
And so that's what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. For David, we're just going to say, just to kind of sum up what he's feeling, we're going to say that he's battling fear tonight. And to do that, um, I want to take a look at six ways that David confronts his fear. He confronts his fear. He doesn't just ignore it. He doesn't uh, try and distract himself from it. And he doesn't learn to, li- to make peace with it as if it's not there, to live with it. He actually is going to confront it. And the last thing I want to say, I know that this is the longest introduction ever. We will get there, I promise. Um, last thing I want to say before we jump in is that I'm throwing out these heavy things. You know, for you it may be anxiety, it may be depression. I'm throwing these out, and it sounds like I'm throwing it out there lightly. And I just want to be clear um, that first of all, when I, when I chose Psalm 27 about the presence of the Lord, this is not the message I thought was going to come out. I was thinking today, man, this is a little heavy. Like, I, I didn't intend for this to be a heavy message addressing these kind of things. Um, but it just so happens that this beautiful psalm, Psalm 27, one thing I desire the Lord, is written in the context of David battling with fear. So it wasn't my intent to have a heavy message tonight. I think next time I'll have to preach on heaven or something. I don't know. Um, but, but I'm not throwing these things out there lightly. I'm not saying that if you follow these six ways that David did, that you're going to address and deal with the things maybe you've never addressed and deal with, or, or the, your life struggle that you've dealt with since a teenager, whether it maybe it's something really heavy, hopelessness, depression. If you follow these six things, it's all just going to be better. That's, that's, not what I'm, that's not my uh, intent tonight. But what I am suggesting is that, again, David, a man of many emotions— probably had more, he probably dealt with more than we did. I think uh, we can safely say that as far as the things that he went through. If he wasn't content just to make peace with those things and ignore them and push them aside to let them rule his life, um, then maybe we shouldn't be either. Maybe we can begin to address these things. All right, that's the introduction. No more introduction. Let's go ahead and pray. And we're going to jump into this. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, thank you that the truth sets us free. Lord, thank you that your word speaks in to the places of our heart that, that maybe we never even share with other people. Maybe we can't even talk about. Maybe we can't even put into words. Lord, your word speaks into just dark places. Lord, thank you that you are a God who heals and restores and gives hope, who brings change. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us uh, where you found us. Lord, thank you for where you've brought us all the way that you've led us so far. Thank you, Lord, that you're not done with us. I pray that tonight would just be another um, word that you would speak into our life as we're on a journey of becoming more like you, Lord. Pray that you'd speak to us tonight, open our eyes, help us to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the first way that David confronts his fear is with truth. Take a look at verse one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So these, these first six verses of this chapter, they start out on a high note. David's actually encouraged right now. Um, we already talked about the context. His enemies are waiting for him, trying to, 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 um, to hurt him and cause him harm. But right now, he's, he starts by being encouraged. But he's tempted to be overtaken by fear. So he's confronting his fear or his temptation to fear with truth. And he's using simple logic. Um, Let me reword verse one and two. He's basically saying this. He's saying, if the Lord is my light and salvation, and in parentheses, and he is, then it doesn't make sense for me to be afraid. The second part, if the Lord is the strength of my life, in parentheses, with the understanding, and he is, then it doesn't make sense 
to fear anyone, and I'll throw in there, or anything. So he's taking truth, he's taking logic, and he's using it to confront fear or the temptation to fear. Now, it's been said before, you may have heard this, that you can't change the way you feel, but you can change the way you think. And if you change the way you think, that will change the way you feel. He's taking the truth that he knows, and he's choosing to believe it. That's why he's encouraged at this point. And you can see the result it's having in his life. You can hear the confidence in his voice. It's almost like he's bragging on God. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He's using truth to confront the temptation to fear. And I think that a lot of the pain that we experience is a result of believing lies. Um, Lies we come to believe about ourselves. I'm not good enough, smart enough, worthy enough, pretty enough, whatever. Lies we come to believe about the world that we live in. Things will always be this way. Everyone's out to get me. Things will never change. And lies we come to believe about God. God doesn't like me. God's out to get me. God's not pleased with me. But knowing the truth about ourselves and about God and about the world that we live in helps to dispel the lies. That's why it's important for us to know our Bibles, to meditate on Scripture, to have it written in our hearts. Because the thing is, there's enough in this world that's real, that will cause us hurt and pain, whether it's loss, grief, um, uh, whatever, whatever it is. There's enough hurt and sorrow that's real to go around. And so if we can use God's word and truth to protect us from believing the lies that cause us hurt and sorrow, then, we, then we're one step ahead of the game. So God's word, truth, speaks in to the lies that we believe, and it brings healing, but it also speaks into the things that are real as well. Um, David's enemies were real. Loss is real. Again, grief is real. Change is hard. And the truth not only dispels lies, but it also helps to bring us comfort when we face difficult times. The truth of knowing um, in the midst of loss that, that Christ is with me and that he'll never forsake me and that there's life after death and you know, in in the midst of sickness, that there's ultimate healing awaiting us, that there'll be complete restoration, that God is sovereign and in control and watching out for us. We have to know and call on and believe these truths as we wrestle with the things that we deal with in our hearts. So David confronts his fear with truth. The second thing we're gonna look at is in verse two. He confronts his fear by remembering God's past faithfulness. Take a look at verse two. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Now this translation here is a little, it's a little ambiguous. It's a little wonky. Some translations make it sound like he's speaking hypothetically, but most make it sound like he has a past time of something that happened in mind that he's remembering. And uh, so it's likely that David is remembering a time or a past time where God has come through for him before. And as I was reading this, the words, I I noticed that the words that he chose, uh, they sounded familiar. When he says, when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh. And as I thought about it a little more, I remembered back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You remember when David is fighting Goliath? You remember what Goliath says to him? Let me read it to you. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43. Goliath says, it says, So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. So it's likely, we don't know for sure, but it's likely that, it, that as David is seeing his current enemies that are coming after him, He's remembering a time when Goliath threatened him to kill him, take his body, and feed him to the birds. 
It's likely. And so what David is doing, whether it's that that he's remembering or something else, he's remembering how God was faithful to him in the past. And in order to do that, we have to develop a history with God. What does it mean to have a history with God? Are you able to look back? You have a catalog of things that you can go back to and remember of ways that God has come through for you and been faithful to you. And the thing about having a history with God is that it doesn't come with time. It doesn't come with age. You know, you can have someone in church their whole life, but if they're not actively trusting God through that time and giving things to God, starting with the small things, moving to the big things, moving to everything, if they're not actively doing that, you'd be a Christian for 50 years in church and not have a catalog of things to look back of how God has come through, because maybe you never trusted him with anything. On the other hand, you could have a young person, a teenager who's been walking with God for a year or two, who's actively trusting God. They might have more of a history with God than someone who's been in church their whole life. So the question is, do you, do I, do we have a history with God? Are we actively trusting him with the small things and the big things and then everything? And if we are, hopefully we are, then we can use that to confront our present fill in the blank. For David, it was fear. He was using God's past faithfulness to confront his fear, and we can do the same. All right, the third thing, moving right along, that David confronts his fear with is resolve. Take a look at verse three. Though an army may encamp against me, My heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. So it sounds like he's speaking hypothetically almost, doesn't it? Though an army may encamp against me, or when an army camps against me, or the next time an army may camp against me. What is he doing? He's already deciding the response he's going to have to something that may or may not have happened yet. He is resolving to respond with faith and confidence in the Lord. And it's almost like a preemptive attack he's having on fear. See, David knows himself. He knows that when the army comes against him, and it probably will, he knows that his response is probably going to be one of fear. He knows himself really well. And so what does he do? He's deciding now that he's going to have faith instead of fear. And this is really important. It's important for us to know ourselves. You live with yourself more than anyone. You know, you, you, hopefully, hopefully we, we know at least a little bit how, how we think and operate. That's part of the emotional intelligence thing. Um, but if we do, then we can take preemptive strikes against the things that we battle with and fight with. I know for me, when I first started walking with the Lord, I used to go to youth camp. This is ninth grade. I was probably 13, 14, 50 years old. I'd go to youth camp get saved, come back to school, fall away. I'd go the next year, get saved again, fall away. I did this for several years. Now, I'm not speaking doctrinally. (laughs) I was saved once. That's what it felt like. It felt like I turned away from God and I came back. Turned away from God, came back. And so when I really started getting serious about God, I just knew there was one point where I was like, okay, now I'm really, really serious. And so what I did was I knew that when school came and I got busy and I had practice, I knew that my heart was going to turn apathetic towards God and I was going to stop caring and I was probably going to become worldly again. I just knew it was going to happen. I'd seen it plenty of times. So what I did as a preemptive strike to that was I grabbed a couple of my buddies and I said, look, I need you to make sure I don't fall off the cliff again like I've been doing for the past few years. When, when October hits in November and things pick up, I'm probably going to start being worldly all over again, like I always have. And praise God, since then, since I did that, since I knew uh, that about myself, since I had these guys to keep me accountable, there, has, there hasn't been any more falling away and becoming apathetic towards God. But I knew that about myself. And so the question is, what, what do you know about yourself? The circumstances that haven't happened yet, but are likely to happen, you know? The kids are likely to mess something up, likely to disappoint you, likely to be disrespectful. How are you going to respond? Are you likely to get angry? You you can kind of know ahead of time and decide now 
when that situation happens, and it probably will, how am I going to respond? You can decide beforehand. So David confronted his fear with resolve, and we can do the same. Take a look at uh, verse 4. David confronts his fear with God's presence. We're going to read verses 4 and 5. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So again, this is one of my favorite verses, probably in the whole Bible. It expresses a longing for God, a longing to be uh, in the presence of God and to be near to God and expresses uh, just a treasuring, if that's even a word, a treasuring of the beauty of God. But the thing is, Psalm 27 is really the last place I would expect to find something like this written. You know, I would think that, that this, uh, this poetry, this song, would, would come from a time in David's life when he's walking around the city of Jerusalem and he's at peace and things are going well and he's just thinking on how good God has been. Or maybe when he's out in the field with the sheep and uh, looking at the starry skies and just thinking about how great God is. See, that's when I would expect that something beautiful like this, a treasuring of God's closeness and presence would be written. But how much more meaningful is it to us to learn that all these things that he's writing about, this closeness with God and love for God and nearness to God, can be experienced even in the midst of difficult seasons of life. And the thing is, there's always something. That's, how, that's what I've experienced. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but if it's not a personal struggle and you're having it in your own heart, then it's a family struggle. If it's not a family struggle, it's a work struggle. If it's not a work struggle, I don't know. It's a, it's a combination of all three. There's always something. And if for some reason you're, you're, ha- you're blessed with a season of peace and, and no issues, well, then you get to fight against being comfortable and apathetic and self-sufficient. There, there's, there's no break. But, but the enemy, again, the father of all lies, wants us to believe that when things get better, and when things die down, and when things get less busy, and when things get less hard, and when I figure out this complex I have in my mind and heart, then I'll be close to God. Then I'll, be, then I'll get back to my devos. Then I'll, then I'll just sit and enjoy the presence of God like I used to when, when, when these things line up. And that's, the, that's probably one of the biggest lies we ever believe because there's always something. And if we don't learn to draw near and to appreciate and to enjoy the presence of God in the midst of whatever's going on, well, then we're never going to learn. We're never, we're never going to draw near and enjoy being close to God. There's always something that wants to stand between us and closeness with God. Now, if you remember, um, there were times where David was in Jerusalem, relaxing, enjoying, free from difficulty. Remember in 2 Samuel, I think, it's, I think it's 7, he's just walking along the rooftops of his house, enjoying, looking. And what happens? He doesn't lift up his hands and start praising the Lord like we'd expect. He doesn't write a beautiful song. He sees a beautiful woman. And he falls into to the greatest sin he could. Another time, later on, he takes a census. Where's he at? He's chilling at home in Jerusalem. He, he gets overcome and overtaken with pride. Let's number the people. He's not at war. He's not running for his life. He's just chilling at home in Jerusalem. In fact, his closest times that he experienced with the Lord and that we get to benefit from are when he's on the run and when he's, when he's in the midst of fear and anxiety and struggle because David knew that the presence of God, it was his refuge. It was, his, it was the place that he was the only place he could turn. It's, the only, it's all he had. He didn't have a, an iPhone to open in the middle of the wilderness to turn on Netflix to distract him for two hours. He couldn't do that. He didn't, ha- he didn't have, you know, people selling him 
things that he could buy and smoke and distract or, I don't know, maybe he did, I don't know. But he didn't. That's the thing, he didn't. David's escape, David's place of refuge was the presence of God and was being close to God. Take a look at verse five again. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Verse six, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing to the praises to the Lord. David knew that a life spent seeking God and being close to God would result in safety and confidence and joy. I think we know this too, generally. Um, we know that we're not always the greatest at seeking God, but we know that if we did, then we, we too would find the joy and the peace and the comfort and the assurance. Uh, I think we know this in our head at least. But my prayer for myself and my prayer for you guys is that our closest moments with the Lord that we experience here on this earth are still to come. Now, some of you have, uh, your hardest days are maybe behind you. For me, I'm smarter than that. I know that my hardest days of difficulty and struggle are, are up ahead. And so my prayer for myself and for you guys again is in those moments, um, when difficulties arise, that I would be a person who, like David, uh, treasures the presence of God and draws near in those moments and experiences the, the, the safety and the comfort and receives strength, just like David did. All right, let's take a look at verse 7 uh, through verse 12. We're going to notice a huge shift here in these verses. And David is going to confront his fear with cries of desperation. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. So how do we get here? Verses 1, 2, and 3. Again, David is, is, is confident in the Lord. He's thinking about the truth of God and the past faithfulness of God. How did we get here? David feels um, all of a sudden like God isn't hearing him. He feels like he's doing everything God told him to do. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face will I seek. I, I'm doing what you, you told me to do, God. And, and he feels like maybe God will forsake him. Now, is any of this true? Is any of it true? For some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't seem appropriate to circle back to point one and say, David, remember how the Lord was your light and salvation when you said, whom shall I fear? Remember how you said God was the strength of your life? Have you ever been there before? When you know, you know it's true. You know, you're just experiencing a wave of something. And you, you know God is in control. You know. You know God is going to work it out. You know God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. You know. And so sometimes what, what you need is not, not the truth. You got it. You know it. You even believe it. But sometimes what we need um, is to move past the realm of reason for a minute and draw near to God in prayer with, with a sense of desperation and honesty. And that's what David, David's doing. He's saying, God, I know you're not going to forsake me, but it really feels like you might, or it really feels like you did. And he's expressing just the cries of his heart, not theologically correct at all. 
But I'm so grateful that God invites us to come broken before him and, and we can express things to him the way we feel, even, even if we know, I know God's not gonna, even if we know it's not true, we can, we can express that to God. And, and, and something about that is just healing and therapeutic. And, and you, you, you come away from prayer after having expressed what's on your heart, even if it's not theologically correct, you come away saying, okay, God is, is in, in control. He will come through. And there's just something healing about expressing um, our cares before the Lord in, in, in this way of, of uh, with desperation as David did. And it, it works the same with uh, counseling and giving advice too. You know, sometimes people need the truth. Other times, other times they know and they, they don't need it anymore. Sometimes they need um, to be encouraged. You know, just take it to the Lord. Bring it to the Lord as a cry. All right, number six. And finally, David confronts his fear with faith. Take a look at verse 13. I would have lost, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have lost heart unless I had believed. There it is, right there, all of it, wrapped up in a pretty little bow for us. It's because I believe that I'm not gonna worry, that I'm not gonna, or that I'm not gonna let worry consume me, let me put it that way. I'm not gonna live in worry or anxiety or hopelessness or fear or discouragement. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay in those places because I believe because at the end of the day, it's because I believe that we will see, that I will see the goodness of the Lord. That's what David's saying. He's summing it up for us. I made it through. I continued hoping and trusting and, and functioning because I believed that at the end of the day, the Lord will continue to be good to me, as he always has. Keeps it really simple. In verse 14, finally, David says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And here we have David's difficulty, his trial, his battle against fear and everything else he's facing, turned into an encouragement. Now he's preaching at us. He told us what happened. He told us what he did, how he got there, where he ended up. And now he's turning around to us, to the people who are listening, and encouraging us, saying, wait on the Lord, be, of, be courageous, be of good heart, and he shall strengthen your heart. And how awesome is it to know that we have a God who takes our past struggles, even our current struggles, the things we've been through, he takes and he works and he does something amazing. He comes through like he always does. And he can take that and turn it into an encouragement for someone else. And we know that. And so my question for us tonight is assuming all of us here have a history with God, that in the time we've been walking with God, we have been trusting him, seeing him come through. We have been giving things over to him. Assuming all that, my question for us tonight is, is who are you, who are we, turning that into an encouragement for? I mean, we have, we have children, we have youth, we have adults. Unfortunately, we have grown men and women who do not know how to process the things that they're feeling and thinking. They don't know how to do it. And so for, for you, and for, for we who have experienced the, the healing of the Lord and all the things that we talked about, the Lord wants to use us as an encouragement for them. I hope you have some kind of outlet to share what God has done in your life somewhere. And if you don't, I want to encourage you, seek God about where that could be. It doesn't have to be teaching a message or leading a home group or, or anything like that, but, but hopefully in your life you have some sphere of influence 
where you are taking what you've been through, what the Lord has brought you through, and using that as an encouragement for someone else. I believe the Lord wants to use all of us for that reason. So David, a man after God's own heart, he experienced the whole spectrum of emotions. He went through a lot. But at the end of the day, he trusted the Lord. He believed. That's what he said. Unless I had believed. So I want to encourage us as we, as we wrap up, is whatever it is, whatever those things um, that you find yourself getting trapped by. I've gone through the list like 10 times. Those negative emotions. I want to challenge you not to forget about them, not to distract yourself from them, not to ignore them, but maybe to confront them. I don't, I don't believe the Lord wants us to live in a state of constant fill in the blank. Yeah, we experience it. Yeah, there are times when there is good reason to feel those things, and we should. But if we're living and being trapped by and controlled by these things, um, I, don't, I don't believe that's God's will for us. So praise God that, again, he, he speaks into our lives and he intervenes and he sets free and, and he, he wants to see his children free. That's what Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And so, so my prayer, again, for myself and for you, is as we continue to walk with the Lord, continue to deal with difficulty, that we would do that. We'd deal with it. We'd, we'd challenge it. We'd confront it. And that we see the Lord keep coming through over and over again, building up our history with God so that by the time we get to the end of the race, maybe you'll have your own journal or book or whatever that you can pass on to someone else and encourage them. So praise God that he intervenes, he steps in. Um, man, he's been so good. He's been so good. I, I love that he, uh, that he speaks truth into my life. You know, he sets us free. So that's all I got. That's Psalm 27. Again, the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful expressions of adoration and love for God written in the midst of struggle. Um, and uh, I, I could keep talking all night. So let me go ahead and pray. And uh, we'll go ahead and get out of here. Lord, we thank you once again for being everything uh, that we need, for being our hope and our joy, our peace for bringing victory. Lord, all the things that we need, we believe that you are. You are the great I am. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to, um, to see through the deceptions we've come to believe about ourselves and about you. Lord, challenge those with the truth of your word. Continue to set us free from the things that we're entangled with. And Lord, would you use us as um, a people who who are an encouragement to others about the freedom and the joy and the, and the peace that is in God. Lord, use us as, a, as your mouthpiece to speak these things into the lives of others. Lord, you've been so good to us, and Lord, we want to share that with others, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.